Again, good morning, everyone. It's uh, about one past the hour. We're going to give folks another minute to log in and get things going here. Hey, let's kick this party off. So good morning. Welcome to WellNet's Auto Digital Roundtable. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items to kick off. Uh, if you would, please make sure your phones are on mute. And secondly, as we go forward in the presentation today, uh, we would love to hear from you, hear your questions, thoughts, concerns. You can type them down below in either the chat box or the Q&A box, and we'll get to those as they come up. There'll also be some Q&A time at the end. Um, with that, today, uh, we're going to learn the strategies, the strategies adopted by more than 40 dealers, hundreds of rooftops, many of whom are in the Auto Dealer News Top 150. We're going to be sharing some real success stories and how you can start your self-funded journey to save $200,000 for every 100 employees enrolled. We're going to be debunking myths and common questions with a deep dive into health plan optimization. To kick us off, I'd like to introduce Keith Lemmer, CEO of WellNet. Ethan, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Terrific. Sound great. Excellent. Thank you, Ethan. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And we've got a fast-paced session. We're joined by a few experts in the automotive space. And let me take a moment, really, just uh, to share with you, really, we're going to spend some time the next hour, as Ethan mentioned, talking about building and optimizing smarter self-funded health plans. A lot of people say that the health insurance system is broken. You know, from where we sit and what we hear from many people, it's not broken, right? It works just fine. It's really set up to keep the revenue streams intact for those that have designed it. Wellman has been working with automotive dealers and companies across the nation to actually remove all those profits, improve the plans, a better member experience. And uh, while we focus uh, a great deal on the automotive sector, we have 11 other verticals that we spend our time in. Um, you know, as Ethan had mentioned, we're working with 15% of the top automotive news, 150 automotive dealers and many others around the country. And it's really to do a couple of things. Let's call it preserve cash increase profit, and really enhance the culture of the company. So with us today, we've got Kyle Balsas, who's the Director of Human Resources for Orsman Automotive. Orsman is a mid-Atlantic uh, automotive dealership with about 20 rooftops. They've recently partnered with Graham Holdings, uh, who used to own the Washington Post and sold themselves to Amazon, and they are an acquisition tear. Kyle's been uh, partnering with WellNet for about six years now on managing and optimizing its health plan. We're also joined by Veronica Ferrari. Vice President of All Atlantic Benefits in South Florida, an automotive expert as well as self-funding guru. She's been working with WellNet for several years now and has several cases on the books with us that are optimizing their health plan also. Ethan Merck, who kicked us off from WellNet, he's also our automotive practice leader based in uh, the middle of the United States in Denver, Colorado. And then uh, we're also uh, grateful to have Jeremy uh, Holt join us today from Crest Insurance, the automotive lead who spends his time primarily in the West Coast, Sidest in uh, Colorado. So these folks, right, they are doing things that are different, right? They are sitting on the same side of the table as their automotive customers. And it's folks like Kyle and others that are requiring change and transparency and understanding. And so with that, what we're going to do is kick off with what we like to say are a few head snappers. So we've got a couple groups we want to share with you today that we're doing some things with. The first is uh, Carter Myers Automotive. This is a 15 chain retail uh, automotive dealership down in Charlottesville, Virginia, run by Liza Borchus. She's the CEO and her organization is set up as an employee owned entity. And so all the money that's saved goes down to the bottom line. Liza is also Cox Woman of the Year uh, Award recipient, Cox Automotive. 
550 employees. And the interesting thing about Liza, and we just found this out the other day as well, is that this is the second year in a row due to the savings and the experience that she's had with WellNet that she decided to give all of her 550 employees a premium contribution holiday. For us, I think that's almost unheard of. And again, this is the second year in a row that Liza has done this. The next Kyle and Chris, Kyle uh, Balsis and Chris Orsman, they've been with WellNet now six years, they, or excuse me, four years. They've saved almost $2 million and really it stemmed from Chris not being comfortable with the painstaking mediocrity of the traditional annual renewal process. And so Chris has taken uh, the direction of Kyle and implemented a variety of uh, savings opportunities that we'll get into today. And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments. The third group, this is Belize Automotive. This is a customer of uh, Veronica's. They've been with WellNet now three years. This group on the first year saved $931,000, $1,300 over the course of the year based in Springfield, Massachusetts, top 50, top 150 automotive news dealer. And this group is on a tear. And the CFO of this company, they like the data, the information, the analytics, the ability to outreach. Fourth, we've got Lindsay Automotive based in Northern Virginia. Just this past year alone, they cut their rates by 5% and they have $700,000 banked that they're going to now apply to other places in the company. They've been with WellNet now seven years and located in Northern Virginia. We've got um, Hollywood Automotive, an organization like this, right? They were formerly with United Healthcare. They selected WellNet. They were already self-funded. And what they did is they had WellNet go in and analyze their claims data, taking two years of data, finding opportunities, whether it be for international drug sourcing, maybe there were Medicare eligibles that could be moved to the plant, guidance of higher quality, lower cost um, facilities that could be used. The interesting thing about this group, right? They run their company, on a dashboard. And so we were able to identify 32 Medicare eligible associates, $10,000 on each, and now working with their advisory team out of all Atlantic benefits, Veronica and her folks were working on removing that $320,000 in savings. And then lastly, I believe, or excuse me, second to last, we've got um, Jim Norton Automotive in uh, Oklahoma. This organization, right, they wanted some opportunities to save on their prescription drugs. And so we were able to put in some international sourcing, right? Having the ability to get the same drug sent to the member's home, and taking a drug like uh, Embro, which normally costs, uh, let's call it uh, $5,000 a month. We were able to source it on an annual basis for half the cost, saving just one member using that $31,000 or a total of almost $250,000. And this is the third year that Jim Norton and their team have been with WellNet. And then lastly, uh, Dark Cars, uh, run by John Darvish, fourth year with WellNet. They've saved over $5 million, formerly with a Blue Cross entity, fully insured to self-funded. And they now manage and they optimize their health plan with dashboards, insight, efficiency, and are really doing things that give them the ability to control their health plan like they control the rest of their business. And so with that, I'm going to turn the floor over and maybe ask uh, you know, Kyle to kick us off. Kyle. What kind of success are you all seeing now by micromanaging and optimizing your health plan? Well, it's um, to be honest with you, Keith, it's, it's numerous. There's numerous prongs to it. Um, a, we're able to see our claims. We're able to uh, manage the, the, the process better. Um, you brought up the international and the specialty scripts. That is a gigantic part of, of, of our process. Um, we have employees that are on specialty scripts that if they would be going to the pharmacy, they're you know, ten to $15,000 a month. Um, the beauty, the, the best part about what, what we're doing with WellNet right now is there is a, a, a team with WellNet that reaches out and says, hey, Kyle, we have X employee that is on this prescription drug. You know, is it OK? Can we push to get them on to this specialty script or this international drug policy or the manufacturer direct? Um, so that that is a, a, a real life uh, thing that actually happens. You know, this isn't just a number that someone throws out there. Um, we have this actually happening on a you know daily, weekly, monthly basis with with some of our members, which is gigantic because um, you you see the savings immediately. Um, we get our claims on a on a weekly basis, so I can actually see the claims as they come in and what it's for. Um, so with that said, I see the claim if it would be from 
you know, uh, if we're paying that directly to the pharmacy or if we get the specialty script, I can see that savings immediately, which is um, gigantic. And that, that's part of it. You have to have your data. You have to understand where you sit. Um, and that, that's, that was really the, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things that we, that we came across is understanding the data and seeing what people are using, seeing people are not using, and then be able to, you know, formulate our plans based off of what the employees want and what they really need instead of you know, having a plan that is rich on something that no one ever uses. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of where, what we're doing right now. Um, you know, and, and Lisa, those are, those are real life, every single day numbers. Terrific, and, and before I kick the floor over to Ethan to, to run, the, uh, run the show today, would you mind talking about like the journey that you all have been on? You, know, you started out uh, fully insured, I believe, with a, a carrier, Mid-Atlantic carrier. Uh, what led you to, to leave them and where are you today? So the reason, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. We were a fully insured um, plan before. When I came on board uh, seven years ago, um, the first thing I, the first thing I always do is I looked at the medical bills, you know, and just saw what the medical bills were, you know, and and obviously they're outrageous, you know, they're expensive as we all know. So the first thing I did is I started digging through the medical bills and said, this is okay, this is great, you know. So we're paying two million dollars a year for for coverage. How much are we actually spending? You know, how much? What what would it cost if we were a, a self-insured plan versus the fully insured route where you get your annual increase every year? It's fifteen percent or ten percent or twelve percent or whatever it is. Um, and that was that was really how I started the journey. That's really um, how I got into it was taking that fully insured plan and then diving into the data to look at it to see what are we actually paying in claims each year? What out of that two million dollars in you know, coming out of our checkbook, um, how much of that really is, is what the insurance carrier is paying. Um, once I realized that, you know, the, the insurance carrier, no matter what the increase amount is, whether it was 5%, 8%, 10%, 20%, whatever number they throw out there, um, they're still making a, a great ton of money, um, boatload of money, actually. Uh, and that's when I started to dig in and say, okay, let's, let's look and see what else we can do to keep that bottom line, to keep our money in our pocket to use for inventory or for numerous other things that can be used for rather than paying out on a $2 million policy. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That, that makes a ton of sense. I'm curious, um, you know, as you guys look forward and, and as, as Keith mentioned, you guys are, are in a growth pattern. How does this type of strategy, do you think, affect your overall growth uh, track, right? I mean, are, are you seeing it as a positive and, and what does that look like for you? hundred percent, Ethan. Um, and again, that is a two prong response as well. And both of them are, both of them are the answers are yes. Um, a, it, the, the, the network that we use is a nationwide network. Um, it's a, a, a huge network. So we have employees that are in, whether it be Virginia, Maryland, DC, or they have, you know, um, dependents in Cal we have dependents in California, we have dependents in Florida, you know, of employees, and they're able to use this policy as opposed to with our fully insured plan, they would not have been able to use this policy, you know, because they're they would not have been they would not have been able to seek coverage in California based on our previous policy. So by by the network that we have, it's nationwide coverage. So it's a huge recruiting tool. Because when we're competing against every other auto dealership in the DC metro area, and there's a lot of them, um, you know, one of the big things is, and this sounds crazy, but what medical plan are you on? You know, uh, and that's one of the questions that we get. And, and when we tell them we have a nationwide network for medical insurance, um, it, it's a huge recruiting positive because again, someone's family that's in California, they can still go and see the doctor. You know, they can still go and do what they need to do. Um, the next part of it is cost, you know, because, because our cost savings, because of where we're able to manage our cost. We don't have to increase. We're not increasing our prices 20% each year. Um, you know, we were able to really hold that steady line and, you know, have a very minimal increase, um, which again is a recruiting tool. You know, it's complete recruiting because employees know that, you know, it's not going to be an extra $200 a week out of my paycheck, um, you know, 800 bucks a month, you know, they, they, they see the numbers, they hear the numbers um, from, you know, media and they say, oh, it's a 20% increase this year for across the board. And, you know, and then we come in and we're at a 5% and, and people, you know, they're not looking to leave because they don't have to. I really appreciate that. I've got a couple more questions for you, but before we do that, I want to, I want to get Jeremy and Veronica involved if you don't mind. So it's Veronica, good morning. Uh, you know, help me understand what's your approach to getting your clients to understand 
you know, that you're bringing something different to the table, like these sort of ideas. What does that look like for you? Yeah, you know, I think when it comes to sharing a new philosophy or funding mechanism, uh, there's a couple different things that I focus on to really set the conversations up for success. Um, the first of which is timing. You know, I think timing is so important. Um, anytime you're talking about a new idea or looking at going through a transition, I think it needs to stand on its own. So, you know, I think if it's something that is grouped in with the renewal conversations, it tends to kind of get lost in the shuffle. Um, so I always like to bring, you know, different funding mechanisms and ideas to my clients off renewal so we can really dive in and focus the conversations um, on those ideas. And I think education goes hand in hand with that. You know, the more time that you have, the more that you can allocate to having these continuous dialogues and really educating your clients on, you know, these new ideas that you want to share. Um, you know, and the last thing I would say is let the results speak for itself. You know, I, fortunately, I have a number of dealerships that have been successful, you know, in this program with WellNet, and I always like to introduce them, right? So if I've got a client that I think this could be a good match for also, I always like them to talk to my other clients that have had success. Um, so that way they can hear it from other CFOs, from other owners, what their experiences have been. And, you know, similar, similarly, so sharing things like this, like what we're doing today or any type of, you know, statistics like Keith was sharing earlier, I think that helps to bring, you know, your approach full circle. Got it. Well, thank you. And Jeremy, uh, you're doing some of the similar kind of strategies there. How are you typically introducing new concepts uh, that will improve your client's health program? Yeah, you bet. Um, very similar to Veronica. I think great minds think alike. Uh, it's It's... If you stick with the traditional um, set it and forget it mentality of you come around once every nine to 10 months, you ask for a census, you throw it on a spreadsheet uh, and, you know, fingers crossed, you get the best of, you know, the best of the worst out there. You're going to be stuck in a, a long-term 15 to 20% renewal, which Kyle kind of shared earlier. If you kind of calendar events and build a partnership, um, you know, with with clients and with dealerships, you have things set out. Hey, you know, six months we're going to be talking about this, and we go through a series of questions, um, and we actually uh, we interview the client, right? We we interview the dealership. We find out the nuts and bolts of who are you, what are your goals, what are you trying to accomplish. We take a different approach outside of just asking for census data. We want to know what are your employees asking for? We go and ask the employees, what are you looking for? Right. And at the end of the day, when we're able to uncover, hey, you guys are missing out on potential top talent to what Kyle said earlier. Um, people want to know, you know, what are, what are your benefits like? Because uh, at the end of the day, they're starting to realize that it's not just a 50, 60, hundred thousand dollar salary. It's the potential 20 grand extra and benefits that come along with it that are a deciding factor of where they're going to go work. Thanks. Keith, question for you. How long have you guys, WellNet, been in the auto dealer space? And what would you say if you were sitting down with uh, the Kyles of the world uh, who want to explore this solution for the first time? That's an interesting question. So we've been working with auto dealers now for seven, eight years or so, while we've been around about 25 years managing health plans for companies. The best and the most efficient way to talk to the dealers, and this could be a, a vice president of HR, a CFO, or a CEO, it's less about a benefits conversation. It's about culture. It's about workforce development. It's what are you doing with your business? What's the turnover like? You know, Talk to us about new car sales. Talk to us about used car. How are you managing your parts and service? Are you having trouble you know, getting engineers as an example. And the more that you can sit down and talk about their business, right? You begin to learn about some challenges and also some opportunities. In many cases, the conversations typically roll back around to employee benefits. And that for us has been the most successful in partnering with folks like Kyle and Veronica and Jeremy in working with either their organizations or working with their current customers and or prospects because it's a business conversation, right? And now everybody, Ethan begins to sit on the same side of the table, having a value, having a savings conversation, as opposed to just let's shop the plan, let's put it on a spreadsheet, let's look at the deductibles and co-pays. It is one of the most important, but also the most expensive items that an organization is paying for outside of their real estate and their payroll is benefits. And many just give a, a second uh, 
you know, uh, look at it. And, and that's not the case with the folks that you're seeing here today and others that we work with. Got it. So Kyle, question for you. I was thinking about your acquisitions, your ability to recruit and retain. And you know, as you bring on a new organization, I'm curious, what's the feedback from your employees around this concept of advocacy, outreach, access to care, transparency, shopability? What's, what's the feedback from your people on that? Well, that, I think that's probably one of the best parts about it is when, when we do acquisitions, one of the first things I do before I walk in the door is I get, I find out who their current plans are with. Cause I, I, I probably have a 99% hunch who they're going to be with uh, because auto dealerships in this area um, you know, it's expensive. So everybody goes for the most cost effective alternative um, you know, which limits a, which limits a person's ability to go and seek care. So that's one of the first things I do is I figure out, you know, who their current plan is with. And, you know, and you find it through a manager or through one of the bills or, you know, through the um, due diligence process. And then it allows me then to formulate my game plan when I walk in the door to meet the employees to say, hey, uh, team X, you know, this is what I understand your plan is. Um, this is what you get and this is what you have. And this is what we have. And this is what allows you to do under our plan. Um, and for very similar costs, um, our most recent acquisition employees actually saved money um, on a monthly basis, going from a very limited um, plan in the Mid Atlantic to our plan with a nationwide network, um, purely because of the legwork and all the homework we've done on this plan for years. Um, so they were actually so walking the door was the easy part. You know, you're not like, oh my gosh, uh, Ethan, you're going to spend two hundred dollars more a month on insurance, and Ethan's already quitting before he's even started. Um, right. You know, Ethan's going home and telling, you know, um, you know, family member, hey, I'm going to save some money here. You know, so it, it's um, it's so so important. You know, it, again, it comes down to that recruiting tool. You're keeping them on board yeah. before you lose them. No, I love that. I mean, I'm curious. Any other kind of specific positive experiences with your members? So you mentioned before pharmacy. You know, that's a really big piece there and being able to, to cut their spend there. What about on the medical side? I mean, any feedback there around, you know, something that happened that was just kind of a real eye opener for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say eye opener, but one of the things that, that Wellnut, again, they do really, really well is they have, a, they have a team. You know, when when a person has an issue or they run into a roadblock with the provider or the pharmacy or whatever, um, you know, the, the, the member can call up and they have a direct relationship. Um, with some of those people at Wellnet. And, and that's the beauty of Wellnet is they're helping solve the problem. You know, they're not putting you on hold, passing to the next phone number or to the next person that's coming on duty in five minutes. Um, I've had conversations with, with members of, of Wellnet team members at eight o'clock at night while members are staying at the pharmacy saying, I can't get this, you know, I can't get this done or this is not happening or how can I get this? What do I need to do? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the list is, the list is long, you know, I could rattle off probably 50 things that they do, but the, the summation of it is, is they're, they're part of your team, you know, while they're not part of the Oarsman team in my world, they are part of the team, you know, um, well is part of the Oarsman organization in my eyes. Thanks, Kyle. Jeremy, I know you also worked with one of your clients on a recent acquisition. Did you, was there anything you wanted to share around that experience as well? Yeah. So, I, I mean, on the on the broker side, I can kind of attest to what to what Kyle was just saying. So we had uh, one of our, our dealership groups here in Colorado just acquire a another dealership in Wyoming, right? And that dealership had pretty poor participation. Maybe forty five percent of the eligible employees were actually participating. We came in um, with the self funded unbundled options uh, that we had provided. Um, and and crazy enough, the the younger population, which we all know, helps. Uh, the cause when it comes to the underwriting process, um, their costs were cut by about 60% because the plan that was in force with uh, this dealership group was way more robust. And because the ongoing um, trend was not there of 15 to 20%, uh, we actually ended up getting an 87% participation rate. Um, and they ended up keeping every single employee through the, through the um, acquisition which was a huge, uh, huge piece to this auto dealer. And he comes to me all the time and says, you know, they're, they're probably about 600 employees, but still locally owned. Um, and a lot of the, the larger corporations are buying up dealerships left and right. And all he comes to me and says, just make sure that my employees stay with us. And I said, well, with this kind of health plan and with, with, your, uh, with your rates staying at or below 
current year after year, I think you have a pretty darn good shot of uh, as long as you keep the culture right, you're gonna you're gonna keep the employees. So um, huge retention tool for them. That's that's a great story. Thank you for sharing, Veronica. I want to bring you back in the mix here. So these are all great ideas, great feedback. You know, how would you partner with with a with a dealer who wants to get this process started? What does that look like? And can you give me some feedback on, on are they typically surprised by the, the, the kind of the potential savings and opportunities for this type of a program? Yeah, I mean, typically when I'm starting the process, you know, for an existing client, fortunately, as the broker, we have access to all of the information that we're really going to need to do an analysis. Um, but that being said, I like to go through a timeline, you know, with my clients at the beginning of the process so they understand um, what it's going to look like and when we're going to be back to share the findings. Um, and, you know, typically when we are able to complete the analysis and come back, I tend to, to find that everyone is really um, excited by the toolkit analysis. You know, it's just a very impactful tool that WellNet puts together. And I think it does a really nice job of outlining different areas for opportunity and areas for potential savings. Um, so I think that's always really eye-opening, especially uh, when it comes to like prescription medications and opportunities there. I mean, I know Kyle talked about that a little bit. I, it's just can be astronomical, the cost of prescriptions sometimes, and there's so much room for improvement. Um, and also, I know Keith had a slide about this earlier as well, Medicare members. A lot of times with large dealerships, we find uh, there's a population of Medicare eligible members that are on the group plans. A lot of times they are contributing to claims or maybe even high claimants, and we're able to identify better solutions for them. Um, you know, one of the dealerships that I went through this process with a couple years ago, when we presented the analysis, they were projected to save about a million dollars, which was 20% of their healthcare spend. And, you know, I think when you look at those numbers initially, you can almost be a little bit skeptical, like, is that really going to happen? You know, a lot of times groups are used to seeing increases, not 20% decreases. But, you know, after the first year, when we came up on renewal, we, we hit that number. Um, and I think it's just, just so impactful to go through that process. And it really gives ownership of healthcare and spend back to the dealership, which is the goal, you know. Definitely. And, and by the way, Ver Veronica and, and Ethan, you mind if I hit Kyle with one last question as I know he has to, to head out? Yeah, uh, Kyle, wh what do you wish other dealers and advisors knew about the health insurance industry that they may not be aware of? Um, I, you know, it's funny. I think one of those things that, that is, is eye-opening that people need to understand is your data, your claims. You need to understand how it works, you know, because um, without the data, it, it, you're just signing off on a 20% increase, you know? Um, but that, that, I think that's the scary part is people, people don't know how to look at the data. They don't know how to request the data. They don't, or they don't want to look at the data. Um, but the data is really the, the key thing. Like you have to be able to look at the data and understand what you're, what you're looking at, because that'll give you a very quick snapshot. That'll give you a quick diagnosis in the car industry. You know, it, it's like plugging the car into the computer. It's going to tell you what's wrong. Um, and you can tell very quickly by looking at the claims data, you know, really what it is. Um, and, and without that data, you're, you know, you're, you're just going to pick up the 20% year after year after year, and you'll complain a little bit. And the carrier will come back and give you the 17 or 15% increase rather than the 20. And you think you succeeded uh, when the carrier is like, I'm still making a million dollars. You know, so that's probably the, the one thing that I would, that, that I would say the takeaway is, is, you know, understand your data know where you can find your data, know how to look at your data um, and figure out how much you really, how much you're really paying versus what you really could be paying. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Jeremy, I wanted to ask a similar question. So what's, when you work with dealers, executives and owners, what do you find they, what do you think strikes them as the most interesting and the most meaningful when they decide to look under the hood? What are you finding there that, that is really um, eye opening for them? Yeah. I mean, uh, Kyle hit a couple of the big areas, um, but really diving into uh, the facility charges, the pharmacy spend, right? And then just the, the lack of utilization um, from the employees because of lack of knowledge, right? What I mean by that is it's so easy to just listen to the doctor and say, sure, I'll go there, right? Uh, doctor says, I have to have a surgery, so I'm going to go to the hospital because that's where the doctor told me to go, 
right? And the doctor said, I need to be on this prescription drug because that's what the doctor said. Well, there are other prescription drugs and other ways to obtain those prescription drugs and other facilities that you can go to. Uh, I mean, I use an example of a, a surgery. Um, and I, my wife was actually the one that had the surgery. She had the same surgery three times in a, in a span of, of uh, two years. Through the hospital, the first surgery uh, was $9,700 facility charges. Through the hospital, the second surgery six months later, was $12,700. I looked at the doctor and I said, I can't keep paying this. We do pretty well for ourselves, but that's a lot of money. He said, well, I also operate at a standalone surgery center. He said, okay, well, let's try that. Well, that surgery center alone was $2,100. It was $10,600. The doctor still got paid his $450 to do the surgery, right? We saved $10,000. We saved our plan $10,000. Right. And at the end of the day, our out of pocket spend was a thousand versus paying six thousand the other two surgeries. So knowing that there is opportunities out there and knowing that these opportunities can be not only a savings to the to the dealership owner, but to the employee drives participation, drives excitement and drives money back to the employer's uh, bottom line. And they want to keep learning more. How else can we do it? What other areas can we save in? And each year we're building on that. Love that. Thank you. Keith, question for you. Why do you think it's so important for auto dealers to shift their thinking around health plan optimization this year? By the way, great question. I'm going to pivot for one second only because there's a question I see coming in from Mark Rakulski. I'll answer sure. that in just a second, but it is directly for Kyle. And it says, do you have an example, Kyle, of situations where you've seen the type of health plan you're offering uh, act as a retention proposition where you've been able to hire good people from competing dealers? And I'll even add from competing organizations, right? Maybe the federal government or Amazon, as an example. Happens, it happens every day. Um, because like I said, we, we're, we're out right outside DC. So we're in a saturated market with dealerships and government workers. Um, and, and, and I don't, I don't remember who alluded to it previously. I think it was Jeremy, maybe, um, you know, we are, that's one of the first questions that people are starting to ask is, you know, not, not so much anymore. What's my pay rate going to be? How much per hour am I going to get? Um, but the questions have really turned to what is your medical plan? What is your medical costs? Um, you know, so this, this really has been a recruiting tool through and through, uh, because when a person walks in the door, you know, we can show them, this is what your costs are going to be. And we know, you know, we're not speculating. We know that it's going to be less than, you know, said company around the corner. Um, you know, we, we know it's going to be less than, or, you know, as great of a plan, if not better than a plan. Um, the only, the only, you know, struggle we may have is with the federal government because their plans are, you know, for the most part, pretty rich and, and fairly um, significant, you know, when it comes to uh, costs, you know, they're, they're fairly reasonable. But, you know, when, when we're competing against private sector, whether it be another auto company or whether it be, you know, someone else in retail or, or anything like that, we, we know that our plan is going to match up and be better and have a lower cost um, just purely because we, you know, we, we have a nationwide network and, and we know that auto dealerships in this area are, are not on that. Um, you know, we, we hear about it all the time when we hire people in, they show us what their plan is, what their cost is, they tell us who it is. And again, I, I, I can speculate out of all the dealerships, probably 95% of them, I know who they're with. Um, so it, it's a, it, it's daily, you know, um, and, and the best part about it is, you know, when, when we signed up with Wellnet, you know, we had the option to choose which network we wanted. You know, it's not like you have to go and choose, you know, Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield or United Healthcare. You know, you, there, there are options out there and you can say, you know, well, let's look at this network or let's look at this network to make sure that it has the coverage that you want. Awesome. Thank you, You Kyle. know, I appreciate about that. Maybe Keith, to go back to you, talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously why it's important, but give us a little snippet of this concept of crawl, walk, run, and what that means to an auto dealer, if you don't mind. Yeah, and, and I'll use the example, maybe a, it's a recent group that we worked on directly with Veronica and her team, this Hollywood Automotive Group, right? 1,000 or 1,100 employees in South Florida. Um, they're independent point solution stores, but a very large organization uh, in South Florida and up and down the East Coast. And they were with United Healthcare, 
Uh, they were self-funded already, but what they wanted to do was to get some insight, some understanding. The CEO is an MIT grad, and they wanted to be able to manage their plan like they manage the rest of their business. And so this kind of crawl, walk, run methodology resonated with the CEO because what he had said, and Veronica, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, they wanted to swap out their plan, right? They wanted to mirror the existing plan, but they wanted that data. They wanted toolkit recommended savings. They wanted things that were not going to hurt their employees. They wanted the things that were going to improve the culture, improve the communication. So in essence, we swapped an ID card for another ID card, and that allowed them not only to save a couple million dollars on the front end, but also another $800,000 in recommended savings of which now we migrate them from like a crawl, which is a standard PPO offering, right? Moving them down with some cost containment solutions down the journey and maybe adding some direct contract opportunities with some local providers in South Florida and then the uh, Pennsylvania area where they're based. And now you actually put some incentives in place and so they're moving down the continuum. And then who knows, maybe in the future, they decide to run, which is where we remove the network entirely. And that's what we kind of deem as reference-based pricing. Now the latter, right? Very aggressive and, and, and at times complicated, confusing, and just too much for any group, whether you're self-funded or you're fully insured, but it gives them the opportunity to say, all right, now I can save some money. Let me see what is down the pathway in the future. And so Veronica, did, did I miss anything or anything to add around that, be it for that recent group that we, that we brought on with All Atlantic or, or some of the others we partnered with? No, I, I think you summarized it well. And, you know, also just going back to the question that, you know, Mark posed about retention, this was a tremendous opportunity for them. You know, to your point, they had already been self-funded, but they really weren't taking advantage of uh, being able to pull these additional levers. And in the restructuring of the plan and the migration to, to WellNet, one of the things we were able to do since we had such a great cost savings was we were able to provide a base plan at no cost to employee only. So that was a goal of theirs. They wanted to make sure that everyone had access to healthcare at no cost. And, you know, talk about a recruiting and a retention tool when you're able to do that. You know, to, to Kyle's point from earlier, you kind of know your competition in the area and what plans and carriers other dealerships are with. And to be able to say, hey, our organization gives you free healthcare. I mean, that really goes a long way. And so what, what do you mean by that? Can you elaborate that on that just a little bit, the free health care? I know what it means. Ethan knows what it means. Jeremy does. But I don't think all the folks on the, on the line uh, may have that kind of insight. Right, right. Well, it literally means free, which I know is hard to believe. But, uh, you know, essentially this group, they offer, um, you know, a number of plans, kind of like a base plan, a, a medium plan, a high plan. So they actually pay 100% of the cost of the premium for that base plan. Um, you know, and with that plan, there are some uh, restrictions in place going back to your crawl, walk, run, you know, that's more um, of a walk to run style plan. So they do need to make sure they're engaging with WellNet and using all of the advocacy uh, tools that we have available. But, you know, if that's something that they're willing to do, they can have, you know, this plan, which again is on a national carrier network at no cost to them. And so if I understand, right, this particular group, and I know them well, right, they have one plan that is a straight national network, right? And then they have another plan that is a no network option, right? And so yeah. they've been able to have dual program offerings side by side, and it's the employee's choice, right? Which one do they want, right? Do they want to get their deductible waived and things of that nature? And, you know, for us, I think we've seen a, an uptick in the uh, enrollment uh, of that plan when we kicked off because of really, you know, let's call it three items or it can be boiled down to one, right? education, 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 which to us is the most important thing in the plan. Most employees, right, they do not, um, you know, take as much time as they need, whether, whether it's them, whether it's spouse dependent and like learning about the plan options. We make that a, a, a priority. And I think we get executive sponsorship and broker advisor sponsorship. And that's where we've seen a great deal of success is that it's that key when you kick off the plan is making sure people understand what they have. And that's what most people are not doing at the moment. Yeah, and I, I would agree. Just say, with, oh, go ahead, go ahead, okay, just to finish it up is I feel like that's the beauty of this process, and you know, and being able to to collaborate with WellNet as a broker is the degree of flexibility that we have. You know, where a lot of times when you're working with a carrier, you're you know in this box, right, and you can do whatever you want as long as it falls within these parameters. But you know, to be able to work with a large dealership, a large organization, and be able to customize each plan 
Do you want to network? Do you not want to network? Do you want to give incentives? Do you not want to give incentives? I think that's when at the end of the day, you can really dial in as to what does the company want to offer as an organization? How does it align with their overall, overall objectives? And to me, that's really how you optimize you know, a healthcare plan. Great. Thanks, Veronica. Hey, Jeremy, quick question for you. How big is the lift? You know, we're, we're talking about these, these choices, these components, but w- at the end of the day, you know, an employer makes a decision to make a change. How much more or is it as much or even less work to transition to this sort of a plan from kind of your legacy options? What does that look like? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, and, you know, to piggyback on some of Veronica's statements when it comes to the, the main term is willingness, right? So a dealer has to be willing to take an outside of the box approach. Once they say, yeah, I, I definitely want to save. I think uh, what you guys are talking about makes a lot of sense. The, the heavy lifting is, is pretty minimum, right? I mean, you, you find a good partner um, to walk alongside of you to, to get this process put in place. Um, coming from fully insured to going to something like this is a culture shift. Right. You have to be willing to um, get outside of the box when it comes to, uh, you know, hey, these are the plan designs. I can't customize anything. I'm just going to take what someone tells me to take. Um, You know, there is some some underwriting involved, right, going through the underwriting process. Um, Again, once that's done and and the underwriting process is complete, um, putting things in place are fairly easy. I think the, the, the easiest way to look at it. Um, for someone considering this and considering, okay, that might be a lot of work is this is going to be your next 10 to 15 years. We're not going to do this every nine to 12 months. We're going to put something like this in place and we're going to build a long-term strategy. So your work now is going to be good for the next 10, 15, 20 years uh, if we do this right. So it's worth putting in a little bit of work up front to make sure that we can sustain a good quality plan and frankly improve it year after year for the long term. And, and Jeremy and Veronica, how much of that, and you talk about, you know, the engagement, the 10 to 15 years, and we could not agree more, is it important that you have executive sponsorship at the company, right? Either be it someone like Kyle or a CFO or, or a CEO, how, how much of that involvement is either important or not important? What would you say, Veronica, maybe to you first? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, sponsorship from the executive level is critical, right? Because to Jeremy's point, it is a shift in culture. It is a transition. And, you know, anytime you go through change, whether it's the best change or something not so great, there's always a little bit of disruption. And I think it's important that, you know, the executives are aware of that and that they're buying into the concept. But, you know, also what Jeremy was saying earlier is hundred percent, right? This is not something we're going to be looking at and uh, working through every nine to 12 months. This is a long-term solution. Um, so we need to set the groundwork correctly today and continue to build off of it. And, you know, I found in the last few transitions that we've done really after the first month or two, especially if you've got, uh, you know, great education and, and resources to share with the employees, you know, it's, it's really manageable. And when you have that buy-in from the executive level, it makes it uh, much smoother. Awesome. Yeah, think, and Jeremy, what would you say? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. on top of that, um, and, and well, that does a phenomenal job of tracking statistics and these comparisons long term, right? I think you put a, a, a senior level executive, you get their buy in, uh, I think is 95% of what the success of these plans uh, strive from. Because if you get the top, the culture mavens, right, driving hey, this is what's important to us. It's not necessarily we want to save, but we want to give you, employee, the best possible benefit at the lowest cost. And we want to be able to offer that from here on out. We don't want to just do it for a year. So here's what we're going to do in order to make that come to fruition. And when you put those graphs side by side from you know the, 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 the traditional plans, shall we say, the fully insured, the bukas of the world, if we put those compared to this style plan, I think Kyle can attest to it, uh, you know, greatly that your average increase could be flat, maybe two, 3%, where normal standardized fully insured plans are eight to 15, maybe 20% with the occasional 50 or 60%, where these plans, even in a bad year with what you've done and the work you've put in can help absorb that shock. So that way that line is more flat line for a long period of time. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate that. Um, You know, we've been talking a lot today about information, 
uh, about being able to make good decisions based on that, on that information. And Veronica, you mentioned our toolkit analysis a couple of times. Keith, do you want to share a little bit more about what that is, what it looks like, you know, some of the findings and, you know, maybe how, what does that what does that take? Like how long does that toolkit take? What is, can you give us some information there? Yeah, no, so, so we, we've developed something and, and mother, I appreciate you bringing that up. We've developed something. It's called our blade toolkit analysis. It's something that is homegrown. It is 20 plus items that we have aggregated. Some we control internally, many we've developed and others that we partner with where we go through typically two years of claims data from a particular client. It could be a prospect of Veronica's. It could be a current customer of Jeremy's or it could be an acquisition target of Kyle's, right? He's, uh, let's say, looking to buy four new dealerships and wants to see what the heck is going on. And so we take that two years of claims data and we share, in essence, what's right, what's wrong, and where are some opportunities before someone even becomes a customer, let's say. And so maybe there is a bone marrow transplant on a Cobra member that we have identified that maybe we can move to a marketplace plan and that would remove $850,000 in uh, expense. We don't force, we don't mandate, but we identify first. Maybe there's an air transplant charge that we identified that maybe is $400,000 initially that we can actually get for $75,000 or a bundled contract uh, in the, uh, let's call it uh, kidney transplant space that may be $300,000 initially that we can source from Johns Hopkins, right? With just some arrangements that we have with tier one facilities around the country and save $150,000 or some of that international RX outsourcing that Kyle had alluded to, or some of the Medicare uh, uh, moving people to Medicare that we've identified. And so if we can go in and we identify seven to 15, seven to 18 percent in additional savings. This is found money. And so what we're making available to everybody that's on the call today, and it's really, we kind of pegged this at about a $5,000 expense, is that we will do this at no cost for anybody that's on the line today, uh, anybody that has joined for whether it's a customer or a prospect. And again, all Ethan and his team need is two years of claims data. It takes us a couple of days to turn this around. And then what happens is the output, we typically jointly present that with you, with the dealer directly, with whichever customer, so they can see all the areas of opportunity. It's not just an underwriting mechanism. It's not just, it's not the network uh, differentials. And there's a question that came in from Tom Davidson. It said, what network, what non-network solutions does WellNet work with? And maybe kind of wrapping that into this response, which is, you know, WellNet uses Cigna and Aetna as our PPO offerings, but we have direct contracts with uh, facilities all over the nation, thousands, tens of thousands of direct contracts. And then we have tier one health systems like John's that I mentioned, like Mayo Clinic, like uh, uh, New York Ear and Eye, and you know many others, Henry Ford Health System, all over the nation where we use our volume, our relationships to get better pricing, higher quality, lower cost. And we do some voluntary incentives to guide members to those facilities. And so these types of offerings, right? If you think about what's really happening, you're now managing and you now have the opportunity to manage, Ethan, your health plan like you manage the rest of your business. Absolutely. I appreciate that. So I want to open it up to questions. Before I do, just final question for Veronica and for Jeremy. You know, what else? You know, what, what else do you think auto dealer executives need to know about this space that they might not be aware of today? What's a closing thought that you might share? Uh, Jeremy, I'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we've thrown out a bunch of uh, ideas, right, in, in this conversation. Uh, what I think will sum it all up is there is a whole lot, there's a whole different universe out there in the healthcare world that is actually predictable, that is controllable, um, that can be customized uh, to fit your business needs, and that can actually be a massive tool to help you attract and retain the best possible talent. And at the end of the day, when you're out recruiting, uh, and Kyle said it earlier, being able to tell an employee, hey, we have a really good plan. And by the way, our rates are probably gonna stay pretty darn similar to what they are now for a long period of time, um, is a very not only a reassurance that dollars and cents are gonna be saved, but it's a reassurance that you're gonna be able to keep the promise that you're making to each and every employee, which is the lifeline of the business. So yeah, and, and I'll just add this so you know, like, I, I know for a fact and, and using Carter Myers as an example, that two years and three month premium holiday, I know that Oarsman Automotive, they've 
kept their premium contributions flat for a number of years, given all the money that they've saved. Yes, Chris and his team, they could have put that money in their pocket, but they chose to enhance their culture and their workforce by not having the members typically contribute more to the employee plan that they normally would. And I know I know Kyle is still on the phone. He may be in the car or here he is. Kyle, any any parting words as well from you? No, that, that was, I was going to bring that up. I mean, that's a, that's a great point, Keith. Um, yeah, we have, that's what we've done in the past years. So any years that, you know, we have had uh, cost savings, we have pushed that back into the plan into the next year. Um, so our, our employees, and this is over the past uh, six years or however long it's been, you know, we've been at about a 3%, you know, uh, 3% increase. We actually had a year, there was a decrease in there and a year there was flat. So, um, you know, over, overall, over, you know, six years, like, our employees have been able to maintain and be able to budget accordingly. Um, and therefore, when we hit our open enrollment, people aren't running for the door. You know, they're, they're not looking for the job, you know, because there, there's no sense because they're, they know that they're not going to have a huge increase in premiums. Um, so, no, that, that's a, it's a very valid point. That's exactly how we do it, as, as you described. You know, we take Thanks, whatever Scott. savings we can and we push it. That is awesome. And Veronica, Veronica what about you? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I agree with everything that's uh, been said. And I would just, you know, say to dealerships out there that are considering something new that, you know, this industry is constantly changing and evolving like many industries. And, you know, we have solutions today that we didn't have 10 years ago or even five years ago. And I would just advise everyone to take a look at what's out there, you know. Don't get stuck on the merry-go-round of looking at your renewal, you know, three months before and just taking your fully insured increase. I think that there's so many opportunities today that can be capitalized on. Um, and also, I just always recommend partnering with a strong broker and TPA, you know, like Wellnet as well. When you have those advocacy services and that extra support, it really helps your plan run smoothly. And if you can align yourself with professionals that are knowledgeable in your industry and that understand the automotive wor uh, world, I think that just pays dividends as well. Thanks, Veronica. I wanted to open up the floor to questions. Um, we had a couple come in that we haven't quite addressed yet, but, but um, certainly now, guys, um, thank you for your patience and, and feel free to start typing in some questions. We can address them here. Uh, I had a question from Donald Franks. Can a dealership with under 100 employees qualify for the WellMet program? Answer is yes. Um, we can go down to 50 eligible and they would qualify for this type of a program. So that would pretty much be our floor is 50 uh, ceiling. We really don't have one, quite frankly. This will work for all mid-market, mid-sized employers. Uh, second part of the question, can a partnership of multiple independent dealerships qualify? That's, that's a trickier one. I mean, the, the, the answer is Yes, but with details, we would need to dig in a little bit more. Keith, I see you have a little bit. You, you, yeah, I'd say if the, if the common ownership structure, yes, and it's right. over 51%. So yes. Correct. But happy to take that offline with you, Donald, and uh, chat with that about more detail. Um, can you work with your, co can I work with my current broker? Yes, you can, certainly. I mean, the question becomes then how familiar are they with not only self-funding, but this type of a program? Right, because not every just because everyone can do it doesn't mean they're all going to be excellent, like Veronica, like Jeremy. So there might be an opportunity for partnership there. But generally speaking, yes, you can work with your with your uh, current broker. Um, Ethan, I had a question that came into me directly, and it says, please. "How long does the toolkit analysis take, and what does it reveal?" And so I touched on what it reveals a little bit in terms of the length of time. Uh, it takes anywhere from let's call it five to seven business days, and again, what we would need to do that, let's call it, we would offer this at, at no cost right now. It's a five thousand dollar value, is two years of claims data, and we can drill into that and provide that analysis you know, sitting shotgun with, you know, you, your customer, uh, and again, deal directly with your advisor or any one of these great advisors on the phone today. Any other questions that we might be able to answer for our attendees, for our participants today? Terrific. Why don't we do this? Why don't we give everybody their uh, five minutes back? We finished in just under uh, an hour. Let's see. Uh, I think one more question under here. Uh, 
how portable are these strategies to other verticals or other industries? So I'll take that. So um, while this is a dealer focused uh, event and we have all these dealers that we had spoken to before, WellNet plays in about 12 different verticals. So professional services, technology, uh, higher education, uh, real estate finance. I mean, it's pretty much any vertical that is not decision by committee, right? It's you know not unions and it's not school districts primarily, but we have customers in, in about 12 different verticals uh, all over the nation and about 24 markets with employees that sit in every one of our 50 states around the nation. So, you know, it's really about, can you sit down with the executive team like Kyle and others, right? Do you have the ability where these organizations are fed up, right? Where they're tired of their, you know, incumbent non-existent strategies? Do they want to get off the mousetrap? And as we like to say, and, you know, Ethan's famous for saying this, you know, kind of control the uncontrollable. So it works for any industry outside the automotive sector. And there's references that we have, you know, up and down the, uh, you know, East Coast around the country in Texas, California, you name it, but a heavy focus on the automotive community because it's a small community. Many of these folks know each other, Kyle and the team, right? They belong to their 20 groups and, you know, they meet and they share best practices. Wellman happens to be one of those best practices. And I would just want to thank everyone for their time today. Certainly Kyle and Jeremy and Veronica, I know we're all extremely busy. So thank you very much for your contributions. Keith, thank you as well for hosting and uh, give you back four minutes of your day. So everyone have a very, very good afternoon. Terrific, thank you. Uh, I see one more question. So do you shop the stop loss or does the broker? So WellNet has stop loss partnerships. We can shop that, but brokers can shop that stop loss on their own as well. Makes no difference to us. All right, we'll follow up accordingly. Thank you all very much. Have a terrific Thanks, afternoon. Everyone. Thank Kyle, you. Jeremy, Veronica, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.